Jeffrey Dahmer murdered 17 young men over 13 years. He would cut open his victims for his own sexual pleasure, preserve their severed body parts, and towards the end, eat their thighs, biceps, and hearts. But how did this once apparently innocent child turn into one of the world's most gruesome serial killers? Did circumstance drive Dharma to carnage and cannibalism, or was he born to kill? Jeffrey Dahmer was one of the most infamous serial killers of modern times. His name is synonymous with mutilation, necrophilia, and cannibalism. You think of the crimes that he committed, it's, they're so horrific, you kind of think only a madman or somebody totally evil, evil incarnate would do this, but when you talked with Jeff Dahmer, you just did not get this idea. He could be engaging, he could be bright, witty, he could make jokes. Uh, he was able to fool a lot of people. People that worked with him had no idea that he was a violent man. This was part of the real danger of Jeffrey Dahmer. He could join you or me at lunch and no one would detect that he was a violent person. Jeffrey Dahmer on the surface was not a abnormal appearing individual. He was fairly good looking. He was well spoken. He was articulate. Never in a million years would I have guessed a homicidal maniac. To me, he's He's always been really a tragic figure, which is kind of hard for a lot of people to understand. But I don't really think of him as, you know, the serial killer monster. I just think of him as this kid who was spiraling out of control and nobody stopped him. Jeffrey Dahmer grew up in the small rural town of Bath, Ohio, a middle-class boy from middle America. Robert Ressler, an FBI behavioral analyst and the man responsible for coining the phrase serial killers, was called in to interview Dharma. His years of experience interviewing serial killers such as John Wayne Gacy gave him a unique insight into Dharma's mind. There is no evidence with Jeffrey Dahmer of any severe mistreatment or uh, uh, abuse in his childhood. His mother had a mental problem. She was depressed most of the time. She slept a lot and f dropped out of family activities. The father was a PhD a chemist and a very busy and very intelligent man who spent a great deal of his time uh, at work. Pat Kennedy worked the beat in Milwaukee for over 25 years. Back in the summer of 1991, he was assigned to the Jeffrey Dahmer case and spent six long weeks with him. He knew him better than most. He was a product of upper white middle class. He was educated. He came from um, a family of means. Yet the fractures in his parents' relationship left a young Jeffrey feeling isolated. His interests turned to animals. He viewed them very differently to how most children look upon their pets. He stated when he was a very young child, seven or eight, uh, he had found um, a decomposed squirrel and uh, the bones were there. He kind of took it apart. He uh, said that he found a roadkill and he wanted to see what was inside it, like a raccoon or a dog. He brought that home, a dead dog that he found on the side of the road was hit by a car, cut that open and looked at the insides of that. Jeffrey started to do this from a very young age. He would roam the surrounding countryside looking for roadkill to add to his growing macabre collection. His fascination with bones would continue into his adulthood but he would eventually move from animals to humans. As he got to be about 13 or 14 and he was coming into his um, sexual awareness that uh, he uh, had uh, had some kissing with another boy in the neighborhood and he realized that he was attracted to boys. Becoming aroused sexually um, and the cutting up of these animals somehow became enmeshed. So what he did as a young man 
with animals, he eventually did do later on in life with human beings. John Backdorf first met Jeffrey Dahmer when they were at school together, here at the Revere High School in the mid-70s. John, professionally known as Durf, has since created a comic book illustrating his teenage years with Dahmer. Dahmer? Well, he, was, he had a pretty rough time here, as did a lot of us. Uh, you know, he was a constant victim of harassment and abuse. <laughs> he was beat up a lot, especially early on. Later, you know, they sort of got bored with him, but uh, um, early on, I imagine he had it pretty tough. Dahmer discussed his childhood at length with Robert Ressler. This is the first time these recordings have ever been heard. I was up visiting a friend's house, walking back, uh, back home in the evening, and these, I saw these three high seniors from high school walking, approaching me in the darkness. And I just had a feeling that something was going to happen. Sure enough, one of them took up a billy club and whacked me on the back of my neck. When we got to high school, it was when suddenly he became this, this, uh, incredible freak, uh, you know, with the drinking and uh, um, erratic behavior. By this time, Dharma had discovered that drinking was one way to dull the pain of his confusion over his sexuality and his sinister fantasies. Did you have problems with daydreaming where you didn't concentrate in school? Well, well in, in junior year, that's when I started drinking, so that was a problem. Yeah. Were you ever called on the carpet for that? A couple times. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, someone getting drunk at seven in the morning is not a good thing. Showing up at school is just reeking of booze. Jeffrey was a lonely teenager who kept to himself. When he did become the center of attention, it was accidental. Well, I was on the yearbook staff along with a couple other of my friends. So we would go Dahmer into sneaking into various photos for the yearbook, and one of those was the National Honor Society, which obviously he was not a member of. And uh, when the advisor caught a look of it as we were pasting it up, he blacked his face out of the photo, which they then ran, which is sort of a, a symbol of his wasted youth. Just this blacked out face, you know, the boy who didn't exist. Jeffrey's complex character meant that while seemingly happy to fade into the shadows, he also felt a desperate need to draw attention to himself. A bunch of us got together and raised, uh, put a pool in of $35, I think it was, for him to put on a performance at the mall of his seizures and epileptic fits and various acts of weirdness. Durf also remembers stories of Dharma experimenting with animals. His odd behavior was evident one fishing trip. Pulled a fish out of the lake, just a little sunfish, and took out a pocket knife and slashed it to bits. And my other friend said, what the hell did you do that for? And Dharma responded, I just wanted to see what it looked like. As a teenager, as an extension of his childhood fascination of dead animals. Dharma began to construct fantasies of sex with dead or unconscious men. Dahmer told me that uh, on one occasion he had seen in the newspaper an account of a young man who was killed on a motorcycle. And uh, he fell in love with the individual just from the photograph. Uh, he actually went to the funeral home to uh, view the, the corpse but he became so aroused that he excused himself into the bathroom where he masturbated. This was also apparent in his fantasy of killing a local jogger. He thought he would wait in the bushes with a baseball bat. This guy would come by and um, he'd bonk him in the head and he'd have this guy. Um, and he actually said he went out and waited for the jogger one day with a baseball bat, but he didn't come by that day. The breakdown of his parents' marriage meant that 18-year-old Dharma was left alone with his fantasies. His mom split, and his dad had already left, and he was left alone in the house. But the adults really failed him, there's no question. His parents, his teachers. Were you pretty upset by that breakup? I knew it was inevitable. Yeah. It was pretty obvious. Yeah, I was upset. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. 
and it was this that led to the death of his first victim. Dahmer told me that one fantasy that he had was that he would encounter a hitchhiker and he would be have a narrow waist, broad shoulders, a bare chest, he would have, not have a shirt on, and he would uh, have very little hair on his body. He would pick, a, pick up this hitchhiker and that they, they would have a great time together and set all sorts of sexual adventures. He was driving down the road and uh, he saw his fantasy hitchhiker. The subject of Dahmer's fantasy was 16-year-old Stephen Hicks, Hicks was a free spirit who was hitchhiking to a summer festival. This was a common form of transport in 1970s Ohio. Little did Hicks know who he would encounter in this car. He brought the guy home. They had access to alcohol. Uh, they were drinking. They got a little intoxicated. But when the guy wanted to leave, Jeff did not want him to leave. He wanted him to stay because he was lonely and also he was intoxicated. He said that uh, when he tried to stop the guy from leaving, a little bit of a wrestling match broke out. And as they were wrestling around, that's when Jeff grabbed the hand barbell and smashed the guy in the head. Now he said when he hit him, he didn't really, he wasn't thinking I'm gonna kill this guy, I just wanna keep him here. Dharma cut the body up and placed it in black bin liners. He loaded them into his car and was planning to dispose of them when he was stopped by a police officer for a minor traffic offense. As he was writing him a ticket, uh, and came back to give him the ticket for crossing the yellow center line, he also, he, like any police officer, he took his flashlight and flashed inside the, the car to see if there's any weapons or any contraband, like any good cop. And he saw the five bags, and the guy actually said, hey, what's that back there? And he said, oh, that's just some trash I was gonna take to the dump that I just didn't get there yet. And um, the cop gave him the ticket for crossing the center line and left. This was the first of the many missed opportunities when Dharma could have been stopped. This is Dahmer's house. This is where he killed his, his uh, first victim. He took it into this crawl space and apparently stripped the flesh off the bones underneath there. And when the cops went in there, turned this light on, and the whole thing lit up. Ceiling, floor, walls, everywhere. Just covered in dried blood. He then smashed the bones up with a sledgehammer, stood in the middle of the woods, and spun in a 360-degree circle, throwing the remains as he turned. He said for the next couple of weeks, he'd read the paper every day to see, was there anything about this guy missing or anything? Never did. So he realized, I got away with murder. I killed somebody and nobody knows about it. I'm gay and nobody knows about it. Again, from the very beginning, more secrecy became part of his life. It also tortured him. And that's kind of how it started and then it just grew from there. It would be nine years before Dharma would kill again. Once he did, he would be unable to stop. Jeffrey Dahmer began to drink heavily after enrolling in college. His attempt to lead a normal life was not going according to plan. After he had flunked out of uh, uh, Ohio State for being drunk and then got kicked out of the Army, uh, he had a short stint down in Florida. Uh, it didn't last very long. With no job and no skills, but consumed with a desire to kill again, Dharma went to live with his grandmother in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, trying to find solace in religion. And he said when he first came to West Dallas, he would go with Grandma to church on Sundays. He tried to read the Bible. He totally didn't do anything homosexual. He didn't try to get involved with any kind of gay stuff. He said he really thought this is the way to go. Religion is gonna be my savior. For a while, Dharma was able to control his urges. However, this proved to be the calm before the storm. An interesting thing uh, that tipped the, the balance for him was he was at the Wauwatosa Library. As he was sitting there reading a book, 
a young man walked by him and threw a crumpled up piece of paper in front of him and walked by. And Jeff took it, opened it up, and inside it said, if you want a blow job, meet me in the men's room. Do you think that that note throwing thing was kind of a catalyst, kind of a trip off? It, it seems that way to me. Because that's when everything started falling apart. What did that mean to you? I mean, this thing. It just was well, just sitting there, sort of throwing out a challenge to whoever. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, it started falling apart. You didn't go, you didn't follow the guy. I didn't. You didn't meet up with him. He said that set the stage for uh, seeking. Uh, more contact uh, from uh, from a sexual side with young men, and that that led to homicide, and that went on 17 more times. Incapable of relating to people, but desperate for his own brand of necrophilic sexual contact, in 1985, Dharma started to hang out in gay bathhouses, where he would take his partner to a cubicle and drug them. He was a very selfish lover. He. He wanted to be the giver. He did not want to be the receiver of homosexual sex. Um, actually, uh, he enjoyed um, oral and um, anal sex, uh, but did not want anyone to perform anal sex on him. Sex for Dharma was a matter of obtaining and exercising physical control of his partner. But when word got around that he was drugging young men, he was banned from the local homosexual hangouts, so resorted to using hotels. Uh, Jeff met a, an individual at a tavern and um, convinced him to uh, come back where he had a room here at the Ambassador Hotel. And he brought the gentleman back to his hotel, drugged him with the um, drug-alcohol combination, and then Jeff himself, according to, he, he blacked out. When he woke up in the morning, this, this person was lying next to him dead and um, was beaten about the face and the chest and the body. And Jeff figured that he did kill him, but he, he didn't, uh, he couldn't remember doing it because he was an alcoholic blackout. He went to uh, a department store across the street and he bought a very large suitcase or a small trunk, if you will and uh, brought it up to the uh, room and put the body in it and actually had the hotel uh, busboy help him bring the uh, body down to the street where he hailed a cab. The cab driver helped him load it into the uh, cab and, and said uh, to Dahmer, uh, this is really heavy, uh, buddy. What do you got in here, a body? And Dahmer said, yeah, I do, and la they both laughed about it. After. The ambassador one that was that, did you find that pleasurable or was that no. equally frightening? Was it, yeah. For what reason was that one frightening? Because it was a total unplanned, it was a total surprise to me that it happened. That it happened, yeah. yeah. For the people of Milwaukee, it was just the beginning of a killing spree that would last five years. District Attorney Michael McCann remembers the time well. Dahmer killed 16 young men between 1987 and 1991. We had no idea that a serial slayer was operating in our city. From this moment onwards, Dahmer continued to kill. Sometimes there would be months, weeks, or even just days between his killings. After already killing four men in August 1988, Dahmer made a fatal mistake. His fifth victim escaped. The police were called and Dharma was arrested for molesting and taking photographs of a 13-year-old boy. With the police and the court unaware of his grisly death toll, he was sentenced to do only 12 months in a low-security prison. His defense lawyer was Gerald Boyle. He had to spend first year in a very, very uncomfortable environment of the county jail, where he could only get out to go to work, and a very hard way to serve time. So the judge gave him this very strong sentence, but uh, nobody could guess. He had already killed four people by that time. Dahmer's sentence was reduced after he made a desperate plea to the court, stating that what he did was deplorable and assuring the judge that it would never happen again. But it soon would. Dahmer needed to get his own place. He moved from his grandmother's house to flat 213 Oxford Apartments. So here's the building where it used to be, and now the city has done nothing with this. Absolutely nothing. It just sits there fallible. 
Now the building was in this design. It was a rectangle, three-story white stucco, 36 unit apartment. Behind this door was a place for Dharma to fulfill his fantasies and commit horrendous acts on others, a place of death and destruction. He would pick up many of his victims from gay bars. This area here is pretty much where kind of the gay area kind of starts. This place right here, 219, was the place he liked to go for the, um, they would have the um, drag shows. And right next to it, Say La Vie was another one of his favorites. As we go this way, there's, there's a couple. Now, he was considered kind of a honey. I mean, he was a nice looking guy. I mean, people thought he was nice looking. And like I said, I wish I could be as lucky with women as this guy was with men. I mean, he, there's quite a, he got laid a lot. He, and he didn't kill everybody that he was sexually involved with. Local bartender Tony Timer remembers Dharma well. Come to the back bar and he'd order a drink and he'd get a drink and he'd go and he'd sit in the corner. He was in his own little world and like he was always waiting for something, which obviously he was. Now, you know. It was here that Dharma met Tony's good friend, Eddie Smith. Eddie was such a, a, a wild, crazy person, so you couldn't help but like him which, you know, Dahmer did. And so they knew each other real well, you know, well enough to, to, to make him comfortable enough to go into a, a house and take photographs. Eddie dreamt of becoming a model, and Dharma knew all the right things to say. At $100 a session, it was easy money. Eddie would be sitting at the bar, and all of a sudden, you know, if, sometimes he would turn around and say, oh, I got to go, got to make some money. And I'm like, where are you going? And, and he'd just turn around and look towards the hallway, and I'd see, Jeffrey's standing right there, and I'm like, oh, you're going. <laughs> OK, well, call me when you're whatever, you know. On Wednesday, the 24th of June, 1990, Eddie met up with Dharma and was seen dancing with him at the Phoenix Club. He just left with Dharma and never came back. It was only at the trial years later that Tony realized that the same quiet man who used to drink at the end of his bar was the same man who had brutally murdered his friend. The community was shattered, you know what I mean? People stopped coming out. That blew my life apart. It didn't just affect my life. But it wasn't just the gay community that Dharma targeted. He was an opportunistic killer who was always on the lookout for potential prey. One of his victims was in the bus stop right here. Right up here is a young man um, from uh, Upper Michigan, who was just down here visiting. And Jeff Dahmer met him in the bus stop right over there in front of that McDonald's and convinced him to come home with him. And that was the end of that guy. Some of the men that he victimized were homosexual, some were not. He would approach them and suggest that he'd like to take pictures of them. Uh, would they come to his apartment? He had already prepared at that apartment a drug that he would induce them to drink. He said once uh, he snapped the, the lock on the door and the person was in his apartment, he seemed to uh, become more aggressive, more powerful. Uh, it was almost like a psychological transformation. Uh, and he became more sexually aroused. He would lay listening to their heart, and he trained himself to learn when they were coming out of the drug-induced um, coma by their breathing, because it would start to get kind of sharp and short from the long breathing of a drug-induced. And that's when he knew it was time to kill them. He would then perform oral sex on them before strangling and dismembering them and often keeping his favorite body parts around his flat for days on end. Sometimes he would have sex with the individual as they were unconscious, but always after they were uh, dead as well. So I mean, it became, I think the preference was for the dead person because that way he didn't have to deal with their, with conversation, he didn't have to deal with uh, uh, denials or rejections. It was strictly on his own turf at that time. He had all of his uh, victims back at his apartment where he would be able to enjoy himself by going through the rituals that he needed to, uh, to perform uh, acts of uh, sexual activity combined with uh, 
destruction of the bodies. He would come back from work and make love with the dead body. He would sleep with it. He would lie with it. He would rub it and have sex with it. He was just very, very enamored with the uh, concept of opening a, a body, seeing the internal organs spill forth, and uh, several of the bodies he would put in his bathtub and pack with ice in midweek because he had to work the next day so he could keep them for the weekend where he'd have more time to enjoy himself with these bodies. Uh, he said to do that, he'd have to shower with cold water so he wouldn't melt the ice. <laughs> It was uncomfortable, it was well worth it. One way to understand Dharma's obscure fantasy world is to talk to someone who shares Dharma's interest in death and bodies. Nico Klaus is better known as the Vampire of Paris. A convicted cannibal and murderer, Klaus killed a man in cold blood in October 1994. He served just seven years in prison and is now free to walk the streets. So I can really relate to, to somebody like him. I can understand what went through his mind and what his obsessions were. Uh, he was really concerned with uh, uh, the aesthetics of death, how beautiful they, they looked like in his eye. This is why he took photographs of the, the, his victims. He would uh, pose them in twisted positions. Yeah, what was the idea of posing there? It was just a way to exhibit control, mm -hmm. the way I wanted them to look, mm -hmm. and to accentuate the physique. Mm -hmm. Keeping these photographs then was, was important to you as well. I'd use them for masturbation. Yeah, and you had a lot of them, right? It continued on and, and grew in momentum that the passions and the lust became stronger. His want to look for this this perfect orgasm, I guess you could call it. He had to do more and more things in order to have this satisfying orgasm. It just started with having pornographic homosexual um, sex, and then ha actually having homosexual sex with people in the baths, and then having sex and killing, and then having sex with dead people, and then having sex with the viscera, and then actually eating the people that he had sex with to get this this superb orgasmic experience. How does a human being get to the point that they can only eat the flesh of another? Only another cannibal can truly know. Nico was working as a mortuary assistant at a Parisian morgue when he tried human flesh for the first time. There is a, a state of a euphoria, right? After you have done it, you really feel uh, on a big high and uh, you are like on a top of a mountain. Uh, during dismemberment, I save heart, mm -hmm. muscle, meat, food, thigh, thigh, arm, bicep, bicep, yeah. liver. Cut it into small uh, pieces, mm -hmm. washed it off, put it in uh, these uh, plastic, clear plastic freezer bags, mm -hmm. and put them in my floor freezer. Mm -hmm. Just as an escalation, trying something new mm -hmm. to satisfy and I would cook it, mm -hmm. and then uh, look at the picture and masturbate it. Afterwards, <clears throat> did that have any any positive effect to, the, to that ritual? It uh, satisfying? It made it feel like they were more part of me. What he did was he bought an adaptable grill to put on his gas stove. We found this, and he said he would just kind of sear it on both sides with a little oil. Um, keep. He did add some condiments to it, Some vegetables and mushrooms and onions and towards the end there that's the the month before we caught him pretty much the only meat that he ate was was human flesh tastes like horse meat in my experience but of course it depends on the on the part that you eat ultimately dharma wanted a partner he could completely control dead or alive he began fantasizing that he could uh, make things much better for himself by creating a sex zombie. And the sex zombie, he thought, would stay with him and all the time he would not have to uh, murder any more. I wasn't getting the satisfaction from him to kill me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I took it to a new level. I uh, had a hand rule that I used for more things like installing my alarm system and everything. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. drills a small bore mm -hmm. very quickly. And uh, with a, a large syringe, I filled that up with the drills and injected it into it. Filled it? Yeah, injected it into the front of the hoping to produce a zombie-like state. He was not interested in having a relationship with a willing victim. He wanted total control over a, a human body and do whatever he wanted. He had met 14-year-old Konarak Synthesomphony in the Mall when he tried out his new drilling technique, but he made the mistake of leaving him alone. I saw him sitting on the sidewalk. Two girls were with him. They called the police. And, uh, they had to think of the story quickly. And they told him that he was a friend. He gets drunk. He was not wanting to go back, so one officer grabbed him by this arm, another officer grabbed him on the other arm, and they walked him up to the apartment. Mm -hmm. And they left. That's when I gave him a second mm -hmm. Right away? Mm -hmm. and how long did it take for the guy? And that was fake. Immediate. Yet again, like many before them, the police were taken in by the courteous Dr. Jekyll side of Jeffrey Dahmer's personality. But with the bodies piling up and a pungent smell emanating from his apartment, it wouldn't be long before he would start drawing attention to himself. Jeff said that this was a continual problem, the smell, that his neighbors, the building supervisor, um, complained about the smell. Sir Pakleba Princewill was in charge of Dharma's apartment building and had to deal with the complaints. Somebody told me that it is coming from his apartment. And so I had to call him and ask him, what's going on? Can't he clean up or what? How did that go? I'd either blame it on the freezer or the fish tank. He, really, he said he almost passed out. What was in that? Uh, three headless toys. Yeah, stripped of flesh. The man who brought an end to Dharma's reign of terror was 32-year-old Tracy Edwards who, after escaping from Dharma, was running down a street with a pair of handcuffs on one wrist when he managed to flag down a passing police car. Had the officer been able to unleash that handcuff, that may have been the end of it. So they went back to Dahmer's residence. Jeff opened the door. They, they said who they were and what they wanted, but Jeff didn't have the key for the handcuff because he didn't, the way he got the handcuffs back from his victims was by cutting off their hands. When they entered the apartment, uh, one of the officers saw some pictures in a bedroom uh, of, a, of a skinning of a human being, looked at the pictures, was surprised, then looked around the room and realized he was in the very room where those pictures had been taken. He yelled out to his partner, grab him. When I arrived, um, I saw Dahmer was arrested on the ground, handcuffed, and I was told by the officers to look um, in the refrigerator. At this time, when I did open up the refrigerator, what I found in there was an empty refrigerator with a cardboard box containing a freshly severed head of a black male. The eyes and the mouth were open. It should be stated that the interior of the refrigerator was immaculately clean. Um, in the back was a box of Arm & Hammer baking soda, and on the side were condiments, mustard, ketchup, A1 sauce. And I felt fear from the bottom of my feet all the way to the top of my head. You, you, you can't make sense of anything that looks so bizarre. Dharma's killing spree was finally brought to an end. What was motivating Jeffrey Dharma to kill, dismember, and eat his victims? Was he sane or insane? Jeffrey Dahmer was just 18 years old when he took the life of his first victim. Nine years later, he was driven to kill again. It was after this that the killings escalated. He continued to kill, and for years he got away with murder. No one suspected the mild-mannered, good-looking, middle-class boy of any further wrongdoing. In a long list of these, I mention the judge that commuted his sentence, the first police officer that let him go in, Ch in Ohio. Uh, when he first got out, he was on probation, but not once during his entire time of being on probation did a probation officer come to his apartment, much less make a surprise visit to his apartment. 
Also, he was under court order to see a psychologist every month. And some of the days, he had just killed somebody over the weekend and chopped them up and threw them away. And then he was in, sitting in talking to the psychologist, putting on a front and being cleared to go. This time was different. They had him in custody and they weren't about to let him out of their sight. Knowing that it was all finally over, Dharma signed away his rights to an attorney. From midnight into the early hours of the next morning, he started unveiling the wicked truth behind his evil acts. He didn't tell us about eating people right away. In the freezer part of the refrigerator, they found individually wrapped and prepared body parts. The thigh, bicep, heart, liver. As Kennedy continued his interrogation, the most pertinent question was why. There was mental illness in his family, and that's not a stigma. I mean, a lot of our families have mental illnesses. The fact that there was a lot of arguing going on between his mom and dad and when he was growing up, the fact that he felt abandoned. I mean, all these things together, could they produce? Who knows? Had his desertion as a teenager left Jeffrey with a fear of abandonment that affected his adult life? We had discussions about love, because I said, Jeff, why, why don't you just have a regular boyfriend, you know? I mean, <laughs> and then you wouldn't have to kill these people. He said, people always left. I could never get anyone to stay with me. So I saw that the only way I can keep them with me was by killing them. But by actually eating the person, that this young man actually became part of Jeff Dahmer. Dahmer did state that he was, had, had, there was not a, victim of his crimes that he did not personally love and would like to have stayed with uh, on a permanent level. It all boiled on the same uh, routine. When they weren't, were going to leave, that's when they died. Even Dharma himself can't provide an explanation. What do you account to the fact that you're, you're getting into this so often? The fact that I was desperately trying to make it so satisfied that they never did leave. But was it just a simple case of not being able to find what he was looking for? And you met somebody who consensually would set up a living arrangement with you. Would you have abandoned then the, the, uh, the procedure that, that you stayed with? The person would have had to be totally compliant, mm -hmm. uh, willing to do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. There's just aren't many people like that. So that's true. There was never any doubt that Dharma committed these heinous crimes. His 60-hour confession and the insurmountable evidence was to solve a complicated question. Was Dharma sane or insane? If the court found Dharma sane, he would spend the rest of his life in prison. If they judged him insane, he would go to a psychiatric hospital from which one day he could possibly be released. Prosecutor Michael McCann had a different approach to the trial. We have in Wisconsin what's called a bifurcated trial. We use the same jury, but we do it sequentially. First, did he do the slayings? Secondly, was he sane or insane at the time? Uh, so the second part of the trial was the real issue. That went on for several weeks in this very courtroom. Dahmer called on his old defense attorney, Gerald Boyle. Boyle felt his client had to be insane. Killing didn't obviously mean anything to him. He had no conscience. So he was not going to be rehabilitated, no matter who was working with him. To the average person, killing and eating another human would not be considered a sane act. But according to Wisconsin's legal definition of sanity, if a person knows what they are doing is wrong, but keeps doing it anyway, they are classified as sane. Gamera definitely knew what he was doing, but uh, he, he didn't care. He justified what he was doing by his own standards. Uh, he knew it was against the law. I think after you kill a certain number of people, you've lost all track of morality. You no longer feel constrained by the morals that bind to most of us. Dharma sat emotionless during the verdict before the judge and the families of the victims he'd killed and dismembered. He was judged to be sane and sentenced to life imprisonment on the 17th of February, 1992. Someone asked me once, how many people do you have to kill and eat before you're insane in Milwaukee? I can say this, that everyone who knew Dahmer, and I think the most skilled psychiatrist, said Dahmer was sane. That is even more frightening than believing Dahmer was insane. I believe he was sane and tragically evil. 
I felt that that was a just end for what he did. He needed to be removed from society forever for the rest of his life. And, and I think that's what he should have gotten. That's what he got. Of course, we had 15 verdicts of guilty and 15 verdicts of sane while committing the crime. Uh, and then, of course, the sentence of the court was such that so long, 900 plus years, that he would never be released. When Dahmer went to the maximum security prison at Columbia, he came in contact with a minister or ministers and started reading the Bible and attending chapel there. Faced with life imprisonment, Dahmer turned to religion once again for comfort and possible salvation. Eventually, he asked local Church of Christ minister Roy Radcliffe to come to the jail to baptize him. After I agreed to baptize him, he heaved a deep sigh of relief because he was afraid that I would say, I can't baptize you because your sins are too grievous, your sins are too bad, your sins are unforgivable. Well, that violates everything I've ever believed, and I would never say that. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. Jeffrey Dahmer was a sinner, and it's as simple as that. It was our first Thanksgiving uh, holiday that was coming up, and so he made a big deal about giving this card to me, and it was written out and so forth. He talked about how much he was grateful for all that I'd done for him and how thankful he was that I was in his life and I hadn't given up on him. Uh, the only uh, emotion he ever had confessed to regarding his murders was, was love. It wasn't hatred at all. And I, don't, I never saw a sense of malice or anger or hatred toward any of his victims at all. In November 1993, two inmates were killed by delusional schizophrenic Christopher Scarva at the Columbia Correctional Institute. One was Jesse Anderson, the other was Jeffrey Dahmer. Scarver got a piece of equipment off an exercise machine, crept up upon Dahmer and bludgeoned him to death, and then crossed the gymnasium and bludgeoned to death Anderson. He knew that he was going to be killed if he asked for the general population. And talking to the investigators said that the gentleman that was killed with him, Jesse Anderson, had all kinds of defensive marks where he tried to stop Carver. But Jeff Dahmer had no defensive marks on him, that all his strikes were from the beginning, from the head. And a very interesting thing, what I thought was interesting was he was killed with a hand barbell which is the same instrument he used to kill his very first victim. He was a young man that I felt a, a friendship toward, and I'd lost a friend, and so I was very uh, much uh, in shock and, and, and disbelief uh, about it at first. I felt somewhat sorry for the man being beaten to death by another inmate. Uh, didn't seem <laughs> right. It's not supposed to be what happens in prison. It, it did kind of shake me up a little bit. Uh, I don't know if this means I'm, you know, not the macho guy I wanted to be, but um, I, I felt really conflicted about it. Um, because I had got to know him, I saw him as a very tragic, tragic figure. I guess I felt sad that he was dead because I don't believe anybody needs to die like that. He died pretty brutally, but you can't say he didn't deserve it, but still. I think at that point it's probably a relief to him. I would think it was that was no kind of life. I was kind of elated. I was kind of happy. I'm like, well, good riddance. I'm glad it's over. That's the least he can do for me for taking my friend. And he didn't deserve to live. You know, not after that. Jeffrey Dahmer was cremated immediately, although his brain was removed at the request of his mother. She wanted the brain studied because she's trying to offset the uh, belief that Lionel had suggested that somehow his brain was deformed. About a year later, the scientist involved with the brain decides there's no abnormality with his brain. Was Dahmer's behavior simply down to nurture? Was Dahmer not born to kill? No, I don't think he was born like that. I think it's environmental. And I, and I disagree. I think anybody who in a young age is the victim of abject loneliness is probably going to have serious problems in life of one nature or another. Did he choose evil? Yes. Was he an evil person? I can't say. And I wouldn't say that about anybody, especially after I spent so much time with him and saw parts of him that were very much like you and me. He had cares and loves and feelings like anybody else. Um, 
Did he have some? I personally thought he was crazy. You'd have to be crazy to do what he did. I don't think Dahmer was born to kill. I think Dahmer had the benefits of a, a good family, a basically good family, uh, a decent area in which to be raised, educational opportunities. He chose not to accept them. Whatever factors led to Dahmer's path of destruction, it will take the city of Milwaukee a long time to return to normality. He scarred the city. He's, he's done something that will probably take generations to, 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 to heal, but for some people it'll never heal.